I'm particularly happy because uh, this is my second talk in IBS and also it was all done while I'm here like from the beginning to the end so I'm particularly uh, happy and uh, thankful and um, the the title the invertibility of a matrix might uh, mislead you to kind of like imagine that this is only uh, talking about like linear algebra or matrix but you will see that this uh, it doesn't have to be it's more like algebraic there's no like graph t today but but it's interesting and uh, as uh, a um, people who are in doing this two screen math it can be enjoyable and this uh, is done uh, this is joint work with uh, my friend, the Professor Her at Yonsei University. Actually, um, this problem started from like 10 years ago, but that doesn't mean that we did this for like last 10 years. And um, <laughs> it happened when I visited uh, my friend uh, uh, 10 years ago, and then she suggested this problem. And then we thought that, well, there, it doesn't seem to have uh, require any like background. So we started for uh, many many uh, days, but we couldn't come up with any solution, and then I just gave up. But but I realized I, I discovered that she actually continued to work this problem with her uh, students, and then she had some kind of results. But I was not involved. But uh, finally, we came up with uh, the result. So that was uh, just the background of the story, and then uh, let me start with. Um, the main motivation and the problem. So we consider a uh, matrix with size p minus one by p minus one, where p is a prime, and then this m is any positive integer, and then entry of this. Entry of this matrix is given by this i j uh, integer, and then if you look at this i, the minus one mod p is just the multiplicative inverse of i in field z p, and then this uh, number times j is just ordinary multiplication in integer. But now you just take this uh, mod p again, and then within this big parent, the uh, outmost parenthesis, this is just a number from one to p minus one. Uh, 1 to um, p minus 1, and then now we just take this power of m, and this is just the ordinary integer multiplication. So for example, if we have uh, p7 and just m, then the first row will consist of like 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, like this first row is always like this, and then the second row will be determined by this calculation. So the matrix is really simple, and our question is really simple, which is, is it invertible? And then when m is 1, it is known uh, called uh, male law determinant in some related area. And then this is known to be singular. But from m is at least 2, it doesn't have to be. And then you can check with small value p and small value m at least 2. Uh, everything is non-singular. So we kind of uh, conjecture that, well, this matrix should be non-singular. but how do we show it? So um, that is a 5-1 case. And then a 5-2 is just a square of each entry. And then uh, the, pro the matrix looks very uh, beautiful. But <laughs> in term, imagine that you kind of uh, calculate the determinant, and then well, the, the, the value is still integer, but you never know whether this is 0 or not. But instead, um, my co-author, long time ago, found out that actually this is uh, the same. Uh, you can just consider some circulant matrix instead. And then they showed that uh, this APM is actually a uh, permutation similar to some circulant matrix by using by permuting uh, this uh, first row or like any row and then 
does any row contain the rest of this circular matrix? And then uh, with this ZP, uh, in ZP, a primitive element is always guaranteed. And then you just pick one primitive element, and then you can just make these values. And then these value will be uh, one of exactly one of these one through p minus one, and then they will be rearranged. But the point is, in terms of the determinant, if they are permutation similar, then this is a non-singular if and only if the original matrix is non-singular. So from now on, our question is reduced to just only circular matrix with particular format. But we're not just restricting our attention to this integer valued matrix. We will uh, get more general uh, result. And then now later on, we will apply our result to this uh, particular format. So for example, um, this is A7M. And then this is not a cir circulant, but uh, they showed that A7M is actually permutation similar to this G7M3. And then if you take another uh, primitive element other than three, then maybe you can obtain uh, different arrangements. But that doesn't matter because we only, uh, we only focus on this non-singularity of the matrix. So now we just forget about APM. And then now we focus on this GPM with some particular H. And then there's some uh, trivial or well-known uh, criteria for this invertibility of circular matrices. And let me introduce uh, two of them quickly. And these two are the most, the most well-known and the most known parts. And the first one is really a special situation called unbalanced condition, which is just one entry in a row is dominant of all the rest of it. Like the, the magnitude is much bigger than the sum of all the rest of the magnitude when the entries are just uh, uh, complex numbers. And then if that's the case, then we can easily conclude that the circuit matrix is non-singular. And then maybe with our GPM, if M is big enough and then uh, for some uh, situations, uh, they will satisfy this unbalanced condition, which is if M is bigger than this value, like in terms of P, then uh, they will satisfy this P minus 1 to the M minus the sum of uh, the rest of the value, and then that the biggest number is dominant from the sum of the rest of them, and then they will satisfy this unbalanced condition. So now we need to uh, prove that what if M is at least two and less than this log bound. And another uh, known and very easy check uh, is uh, Frank Simanka theorem. And we'll revisit this theorem later as a simple application from our results. But uh, it's easy to uh, remember. Suppose Q is prime. So now we consider this uh, prime size. And then the matrix, uh, the circulant matrix, the notation B0 through ZQ1 is you just take the first row. But it doesn't have to be always first row in terms of the determinant. But for our convention, we just consider the first row. And then with this circulant matrix, and furthermore, uh, the entries are only rational values. In that case, the matrix is singular if and only if either there's sum of the first that all the entries of each row is just zero, or everything is the same. Otherwise, the matrix is automatically non-singular. But this, pro um, this theorem is not so helpful because uh, for our problem, APM, the size is always P minus 1, which is never prime itself. So this is not applicable. But anyway, uh, this theorem is very useful for this uh, prime size, if you consider this uh, prime size uh, circulant matrix with rational numbers. And then our main result is just the generalization of this case with arbitrary size, if you remember from our title. OK, so here is our main theorem. And then we need some kind of uh, background, but let me just quickly mention uh, the main uh, statement first. 
So for any positive number n, so that's the arbitrary size, n by n matrix, then let P be an n by n circulant matrix with uh, the first row, V0, V1 through Vn minus 1 from rational entries, uh, rational numbers, then if this matrix is singular, then either the entries in the first row uh, must satisfy all of their sum is zero, like the same as the previous uh, uh, the prime size case, or the other case is there exists uh, some factor, uh, and positive factor, a divisor, uh, which is not equal to one such that uh, this is a linear combination of the entries, these rational numbers, with some particular integers, which is called Ramanujan sum. So I'll tell you in my next uh, slides what this Ramanujan sum is and how do we calculate these. But uh, at least I can say here is these uh, Ramanujan sum is always integer, positive integer. Uh, no, just integer. So uh, this uh, simple shape, right? So if n is given, there are not many divisors, right? You can always determine the complete list of the divisors, and then for each divisor, the values are determined. So one of these linear combinations should be satisfied as zero. And if this is not the case, then the matrix is non-singular. So this is exactly the same uh, equivalent statement as, uh, so you can just uh, make use of this condition as a uh, substitute condition to be non-singular. So uh, this circulant matrix with n by n size with first row from rational numbers, then if their sum is non-zero. And furthermore, if every divisor, uh, this uh, linear combination is never zero, then you can conclude that your matrix is non-singular. So we're gonna use this uh, version, most likely, rather than the first, uh, the theorem version, but for the proof, we will use this uh, statement of the theorem. So let me quickly mention about the sketch of the proof, and uh, this is really enjoyable, I guess, because this is just a combination of elementary uh, abstract algebra uh, review and some other related uh, field theory and so on, so it's kind of a good uh, memoir from a long time ago for everybody. <laughs> so suppose that V is circulant matrix uh, consisting of this V from rational values. And for this any circulant matrix, whether the entries are rational or not, uh, this is a well-known theorem. So we're going to use it because we just assume that what if our circulant matrix has is singular, then the determinant formula is given by, which is just the product of all of these uh, eigenvalues. And in this circulant case, matrix case, each eigenvalue is uh, forming this particular shape where this uh, epsilon is a primitive root of unity, uh, primitive nth root of unity. So when n is a size is determined, given, then you can just pick one uh, primitive uh, root of unity, and you can easily take the uh, e to the uh, 2 pi over n i, right, as one, but there can be many other. So you can just take one of them, and then uh, this should be zero, which means that if the certain matrix is singular, then there should exist some L, like this uh, eigenvalue, at least one eigenvalue, uh, which is zero. Okay? And then now we can observe that this uh, epsilon to the L, so some value L uh, is primitive, it doesn't have to be a primitive uh, nth root of unity anymore, but it should be a primitive d root of unity for some divisor of n, because uh, x to the n minus 1 can be factorized by uh, this, uh, what is called cyclotomic polynomial of every divisor. So it should be a root of one of these, uh, at least one of, of this d, and then this is a primitive, primitive d root of unity. So now if you found, I mean, this is guaranteed, and then once you have this situation, uh, for this d, we let w1, w2 through wp of d, where this p of d is uh, Euler totient function, 
which is the number of integers uh, relatively prime to d up to e, right? The root of this uh, cycle can be polynomial. And then from an elementary known result on this abstract algebra, we know that for each i, there exists an isomorphism, field isomorphism in this case. Uh, Q of W1, the notation is the smallest field containing Q and this root. To uh, this Q of W1 itself, such that Fi of W is Wi. So you can pretty much, you can actually send from anyone to anyone else among these uh, primitive uh, D through the unity. And then uh, this, item, uh, this isomorphism is guaranteed. And then furthermore, this isomorphism is the same as the identity restricted on Q. And this is really useful because you just apply this uh, isomorphism to our uh, eigenvalue is zero. And then the coefficient will be just a zero, I mean, uh, preserved as this V0, V1 through V2. And then those are just changed to the power of other, uh, one of those uh, other roots. And then you just continue. Then you obtain exactly V of D many of these identities. And then the rest of them, uh, just a usual trick. You just add them up together. And then the first uh, one is just one plus one plus up to P of D. And then uh, the second, the coefficient of the second term is W1 plus W2 through uh, W P of D and so on. And now this is what it is called uh, Ramanujan sum, which is the sum of, for any given uh, number n, the sum of this nth power of these primitive roots of unity is called Ramanujan sum. And more precisely, this uh, when d is given and then n is given, then this nth power the sum of the nth power of these primitive root is c d of n is the sum of e to the 2 pi n over d, uh, e, to the, e to the 2 pi a n over d, the i, and that's all the sum where a and d are relatively prime. And then you can just compare this uh, definition and this notation, they are identical, right? So we're back to the statement. And instead of this sum of their uh, nth power of primitive roots, these are the numbers. And then the rest of them is just uh, to calculate and then find uh, the conditions and then just apply whether uh, what kind of matrix will uh, satisfy this sufficient condition and so on. So maybe uh, might be. I will come back to uh, some properties of this Ramanujan sum, but maybe let me just uh, summarize a little bit by using this explicit example, what I did in the proof of this main theorem. So for example, when n is 12, and then there are uh, six divisors, and the epsilon to the L, or like uh, what I said, this W1 or W2 and so on, are these numbers. So as uh, the, the known theorem, if the determinant is zero, then one of these, there, you can find one of these uh, roots of uh, like 12 roots of unity that will satisfy this uh, eigenvalue kind of format in terms of this polynomial using this uh, uh, root. So for example, if uh, this eigenvalue, zero eigenvalue help, happens here, which means you can just call this this W1 and this is W2. And then if that root is from when D is four, that means this is a primitive fourth root of unity. Now you can just see where this uh, red part is from uh, related to um, one and three are relatively prime to four and one and five are relatively prime to six, and one, five, seven, and 11 are relatively prime to 12. 
And then this is just 12 divided by D and 12 divided by 6 and so on. So now you see that, well, every 12th root of unity appears exactly once. And it's kind of a partition. And then within the same uh, D, they are primitive roots and then they can, you can find, I mean, uh, the isomorphism, one isomorphism is guaranteed from one root to the other within this one, I would say, like orbit, right? So this is guaranteed. So if it happened here, then everything else will be gener uh, produced. But this doesn't have to be, maybe uh, this uh, lambda L, the eigenvalue might happen somewhere else, like here. And then you can just calculate the sum of these roots and the power of these roots in every case. And then this uh, sum is called Ramanujan sum. Now, we're back to some known properties about Ramanujan sum. So like I mentioned earlier, this is always an integer. And then uh, when d and d are the same, then the value is p of d, Euler quotient function. And if the number is uh, a product of d and d prime, where d and d prime are relatively prime. For example, p, uh, c sub 6, then 2 times 3 is 6. And then c sub 6 of n is the same as c sub 3 of n times c sub 2 of n, and so on. So, and then maybe some prime, or prime power, the, um, there is a exact formula for that. But unfortunately, in general, when n is given, when d is given, then uh, no closed form of the formula is known in general. But once d and n are given with specific numbers, then you can exhaustively calculate by applying one of these properties and then obtain the values. So using our theorem, like the, our theorem has this format if, um, so circulant matrix is given on n by n sides and then the entries are just uh, uh, rational numbers. And then if uh, those, the, the first row, the entries are not, sat, uh, are not satisfying any of those identities to be obtained, then you can conclude that D is non-singular. Uh, non so remembering that, we uh, quickly apply our uh, result to obtain a shorter uh, proof for this known theorem. So like I mentioned, when the size is uh, prime by prime, then uh, this, is, this was actually um, sufficient and necessary condition. Our uh, results only guarantee this uh, sufficient part, but actually this is sufficient and necessary condition to be singular. But uh, in this uh, special case, uh, the, uh, being, the sufficiency for being singular is immediate. So one uh, direction is uh, easily um, resolved. And the other one is now we apply our result. So now suppose that this given uh, circulant matrix is singular, and furthermore, what if the sum is uh, non-zero? Then we have a condition that Q minus 1 times D0 because uh, this was P of um, Q, 0, plus C, um, Q of 1, C1, plus CQ, 2, B2. Zero. If you apply one of those like basic uh, properties of this Ramanujan sum, you will see that these values are all negative ones. And this is Q minus 1. So Q minus 1 times D0 is the sum of the, all the rest of it. So if you, we, our uh, goal is, uh, since it's singular, this must be the same as the sum of the rest of uh, the entries. Now, what if not all Vjs are equal? 
because uh, that's the uh, conclusion that we want to come up with. So since they are not all equal, at least there, there are at least two values that are different. So now easily we can just take the maximum value and take the minimum value. And then if this vi0 is maximum and these uh, others are just, uh, there is a minimum value and some uh, could be the same as maximum or minimum, but we see that this vi0 is already bigger than its minimum value. And they just add up the same maximum value in one side and then add up maybe a small number and maybe the same number on the other side, so they cannot be equal, right? And then the other, uh, the remaining sentence, just, uh, just a comment of it doesn't have to be the first entry, but we can easily rotate to come up with this non-singular and non-singular property, and then you just obtain this result easy way. So, that was uh, the smallest case as a size. So what if uh, the next uh, smallest or next complicated, uh, simple, uh, simplest case is what if the number is instead of just prime, what if the number is just two times prime? Like p minus one, two q might be our next target. So the size is two q by two q rational filtering matrix with uh, odd prime q, now suppose that the sum of the entries of the first row is non-zero. We always exclude this common condition. And then by our corollary, we only need to check three uh, divisors, when these two, when these q, and when these two q. And then for each of this d, we simply calculate cd of zero, cd of one, cd of two, and so on. So explicitly, the three conditions are, for example, when these two, then the value is always alternating with one and minus one. So with this positive part, you will uh, collect here, and then all the rest of this negative one, you will collect here. So you just need to check whether this identity is satisfied or not, okay? And then the other, when these q, and again, the similar argument as before, you only have v0, vq with this uh, coefficient q minus 1 with positive value, and then all the rest of them will be negative 1. So this will be the right-hand side, and you include everything. And finally, when these 2q, this looks very complicated, but this is not, because if you have... <coughs> Q, 2, and now we have 2Q. And then as one of the properties of this Ramanujan sum, you have 2Q of N or J, then this is just the product of C2, J times C, Q, J. And then now we have all uh, the numbers, 2, like V0, V1, V2, like uh, actually 0, 1, 2 as an index. And so on, then we have uh, 1 minus, is it minus 1? This one? Uh, 1. So actually, this 0 is 2q, right? But uh, for some reason, we started from 2q, the n is always 0, and then this is actually 1, 2, and so on. So minus 1, 1, minus 1, and so on, alternating. And for this q, we have um, q minus 1, and then there will be one more q here, and then this is 2q minus 1, and this is the only other q minus 1 value, and then all the rest of them is minus 1 and minus 1, and so on. Now you can just combine which, which uh, index will be positive and which index will be negative. And we have uh, this bq with positive, and then the other positives are uh, even index. And then for this negative with v0, and then the other uh, indices are just uh, odd indices. So we obtain these identities and, and the remaining work is just check your matrix. Never, I mean, we're back to our APM that was already a long time ago, like GPM, and then this won't satisfy this condition, this won't satisfy this condition, or this won't satisfy this condition, right? So back to uh, 
like 30 minutes ago, I introduced the APM, and we already forgot APM. Instead, we remember this TPM, right? And that are from this any primitive element of ZP, where this P is also prime, consists of two Q plus one, and Q is also an odd prime. And then, uh, since every entry is a positive integer, the sum never makes zero. So we already excluded our common uh, case. And then what about this condition? Can they be equal by using those integers? 1 to the m, 2 to the m, 3 to the m, and so on. And no matter how they are arranged, this cannot happen. Why not? Because we have only odd many number of odd numbers. So they cannot be split into left hand side and right hand side can make equal as a parity. So this is not, uh, the equality cannot happen, so we are happy, right? And what about the next one? And then we'll uh, come to the second one, but uh, let me list uh, this again. And then I already mentioned this one, and then uh, now we're in the second case. And first of all, we observe that for any primitive element, where this uh, H is primitive element, J plus P minus one over two, mod P. It's always equal to, so it is a known fact, uh, P minus H to J mod P. And this is quite useful for this case and the next case that I will show you uh, later on. And then we have this uh, relation. So they're making like pairing by making the same sum with P. So if we, uh, Q plus one has some value, then V uh, Q minus one plus uh, VQ will have, uh, VQ minus one will have uh, some value P minus this value and so on. And now uh, when J is not from zero, but one through q minus one, they will cover every uh, integer except for one and two q. So we have this uh, situation. But look at the right hand side shape. And this is, as I mentioned from observation one, they will make this uh, pairs j plus one to the m plus two q minus j to the m. And this is just the format of x to the m plus some constant common constant minus x to the m. And by using this elementary cal uh, calculus, you see that this is maximized when x is one, when x is between one and half of this value. So therefore, the left-hand side sum has the largest value with q minus one pairs, and the right-hand side, similar kind of values with q pair, q minus one pairs, but this, each pair always wins over the other part. So uh, the identity cannot be achieved and actually left hand side is always bigger than the right hand side. And then maybe this looks more complicated but in fact this is not. Because we use similar argument and then this uh, VQ and V0 are so special element here because one is one and the other is uh, two Q. And then we just make use of uh, just the comparison Identity, easy. And then now, finally, if you compare these two, and these are covering all the numbers from the entry, uh, the first row, all the entries. And then now they are covering only this odd indexed one. But for this even indexed one, are uh, replaced by V0, which is the minimum value, one. So this is always uh, happening. So identity is never uh, satisfied. And then by our corollary, we conclude that a PM with this uh, particular type is always non-singular, so any M at least two. So let me make a simple, uh, very small comment. And I discovered that this kind of prime number, P is two Q plus one, where Q is also odd prime, is called uh, what safe prime for P and uh, Sophie Thurman prime for Q. And then it's not 
it is still not known whether there are infinitely many such pairs or not. So it's conjectured for a long, long time. And then from this OEIS site, from this code number, uh, the first state primes are these numbers. So if the conjecture is true, then we covered infinitely many <laughs> cases uh, we showed. Uh, and it depends on <laughs> the result. But uh, at this point, we can't say that. And then our next case is maybe we consider this size is 2q by 2q. And then the next simplest is maybe like 4q by 4q. And the next one is 8q by 8q, and so on. So you can either make this uh, power of 2, or power of q, or maybe other combinations of primes. And actually, we have some kind of this complete list of these conditions, but we're not talking about everything here. Then now will just show how complicated once uh, to the k, k is bigger than 1. And then we have some types of their divisors. And these one is always uh, appearing as a common case, and then q, and then 2 to the k only, and then 2 to the t times q. And then this looks really complicated. But if you apply our same like, calculation table, and this is something like everything, every index that makes the, uh, the coefficient positive is something that is divisible by 2 to the t minus 1, but not divisible by 2 to the t, divisible by q, not divisible by q, and those are the only uh, survived cases. And if uh, the index doesn't divide uh, 2 to the t minus 1, then the values are all 0. So not every entry appears. But I think this is more uh, visualizing <laughs> how it works in the situation. So that's why we have this long you know, uh, expression. And then 2 to the k, k or to, uh, 2 to the t, actually, that was typo. And then we have some uh, summation, but not everything, but like only the index uh, divisible by 2 to the t minus 1, and so on. So maybe if you have some energy, and if you have like a great motivation, then with this uh, k at least uh, 3, then you can just check whether your example satisfy this condition or not. And in fact, we were able to show <laughs> that uh, p is 4q plus 1, where uh, q and p are odd primes, but not every uh, such pairs, but we have some restriction. If uh, 2 to the q mod p, uh, uh, that value, and if that number is 0 mod 4, if it's even, then divisible by 4. Or if it was odd, then it is uh, 1 mod 4. Then we resolved all the conditions. And the reason why we use 2 instead of just uh, any uh, primitive element h, it is uh, known that in this format, 4q plus 1, where q is odd prime, then 2 is always a primitive element. So instead of like having unknown, but guaranteed uh, h, we just specifically use this 2 as our primitive element in this case. And one comment about this case is, uh, for example, when p is 13 or 29, this APM, the original problem, is non-singular for every odd m, unfortunately. But it's even still open. And then for the list of pairs, q and p, with this format, up to q at most 200. There are not many such pairs, maybe like 13 of these pairs, but half of them are satisfying our condition, and half of them are remaining still open. And then these are the cases we could resolve, and then the other six uh, cases are not satisfying. In other words, uh, this r value is either 3, uh, 2 mod 4, or 3 mod 4. So those are uh, the remaining cases, but still we don't know whether uh, APM uh, will be non-singular or not by using our method. And then, for this case, we need to check these six conditions. And uh, don't be panicked. I'm not going to go over any of them. But with this, uh, 
uh, black colored uh, letters one, three, and six. They're easily resolved by using this parity check and uh, by using simple uh, comparison. But this red colored uh, items, they uh, require quite a number of steps for each case. So each one requires different uh, techniques. So we used uh, some calculus method and some number theory, uh, some uh, results from uh, other like algebra related uh, parts. So I'm not going to show you any of these uh, red colored <laughs> items. And then if you are interested in, you can uh, quickly check number one, number three, and number six. These are not uh, difficult at all. Just uh, two or three lines will be okay to be checked. But we resolved all of them. Actually, uh, for number five, we needed this restriction. For the rest of them, well, they all resolved without any restriction. But for number five, uh, we could only use, uh, we need to use uh, this condition and when n is odd, something. Uh, things like that. So combining this together, we just come up with uh, the result. So maybe this table <laughs> might be helpful, like p uh, prime. And then uh, by this uh, unbalanced bound that I mentioned earlier, the trivial bounds. So along this diagonal, left diagonal, uh, already result, like p minus 1. Okay? And then now for the rest of this small, like relatively small m, uh, 7, 11, 23, 47 are 2p plus 1 case. And then this 13, 17, 19, and then there might be other uh, with this uh, two stars are proved by our theory. And then now you see this club shape. Those are uh, numerically checked values. So at least numerically, they show that, well, none of them is uh, Singular. That means uh, everything is non-singular. So we still have hope for resolving. Maybe still using our result, but very messy and complicated uh, application. Or maybe we need to find another approach to uh, cover the rest of the cases. OK. And then as a final <laughs> small piece of uh, another application, Although we were motivated by APM in the beginning, but after discovering uh, our general theorem, maybe it's interesting to apply this result to circulant zero one matrices. And the zero one matrices are really useful in various other areas like uh, coding theory or maybe communication theory and so on. And then they're also interested in uh, non-singularity of those uh, zero one, and in particular, circulant zero one matrices. And then this, I feel more comfortable on this particular setting because you simply consider uh, this di to be either 0 or 1. So if that is 1, then you just make a contribution by 1, and that's 0, then you just ignore it, and so on. So this is uh, one known result. And let me quickly uh, introduce. So for a circulant 0 matrices with k1, and k plus 1 zeros. So this is really restrictive. The size is 2k plus 1, odd size. But uh, 2k plus 1 doesn't have to be prime, just a number. But uh, the number of zeros is always exactly one more than the number of ones. So in this setting, if this 2k plus 1 is prime power, then no matter how you arrange your uh, zero and ones with that many in the first row, and then make a circulant matrix, this is always non-singular. And then the other one is the size is PQ, where P and Q are distinct odd primes. And again, no matter how you arrange uh, this uh, 1 and 0, this is always non-singular. But this is not always the case, because the same uh, author discovered that actually if the size 2k plus 1 is PQ and P times Q times R, where these are all distinct odd primes, then maybe certain arrangement makes uh, this certain matrix singular. And certain other arrangement makes this uh, it's non-singular. So it depends on two uh, things. One is the size and the number of ones, or maybe number of zeros automatically. 
and the other one is the arrangement. And now we can consider some more general setting, which is let V be a zero uncertain matrix with some any arbitrary number of ones like m ones, and then the rest of them n minus m zeros in the first row. And now suppose that n is prime power. So it sounds a little bit similar to the previous case, but the previous case is just uh, uh, take this exactly the half of them, the zero, and exactly the half of them one, and then that's one uh, difference. But in this case, we have uh, some like more rather like unbalanced number of zeros and number of ones, and unbalanced uh, case is uh, makes this matrix non-singular weirdly because in this case, if the number of ones is only from, it, it should have at least one one and at least one zero all, all the time. Otherwise, those matrices are non -sing, uh, just singular. So if the number of uh, ones is at least one and at most p minus one, or if the number of zeros is at least one and at most p minus one, then the matrix is always singular. So for example, uh, in particular, when t is large, then uh, the discrepancy is huge, like the number of ones and the number of zeros. Right? But when t is one, for example, then we already have the answer from the known theorem. right? So if it has at least one one, at least one zero, the sum is never zero, and then they're not identical, so it should be. Uh, non-singular, but what about uh, t to the 10th, for example? And we have only a small number of ones, and then all the rest of them are zero. Or the other way around, only a small number of zeros, and then the rest of, majority of them are all ones, then still, we guarantee that no matter how we arrange the zero and ones, they are all non-singular. And need just, uh, since this is prime power, just sufficient to show that for every s, that's uh, like p to the s is the only uh, format of the divisors. And then now we have uh, this index, index uh, which is divisible by p to the s. And then all the other indexes divisible by p to the s minus 1, but not divisible by p to the s. And then the rest of them uh, will have coefficient 0. So only these will appear in our cases. But for example, if the number of ones is very small, like between one and p minus one, we can uh, assume that maybe without loss of generality, the first entry in the first row will be one. So if you already use one, at least one one here, then the sum guarantees at least p minus one. And how many ones are left? It's p minus two. So even if uh, everything appears here, we have only p minus 2. And p minus 1 is always bigger than that number, so we win. So we conclude that, well, in this case, this is non-singular. What about the other case? Well, that sounds really similar, but it has uh, a little bit of more work, but very similar way. So suppose that uh, the number of zeros is at least 1 and p minus 1. And without loss of generality, this time we will assume that the first entry of the first row is just zero. And so we already use zero here. And since the number of zeros is only at most p minus one, we already used one. And then the remaining number of zeros will be p minus two. So even if you use all the zeros here, hypothetically, the sum is huge enough. The whole number of terms, which is p to the p minus s, many, right? So that will be the maximum sum minus p minus p plus 2. And what about the left-hand side? So the right-hand side here, uh, even if you use the full number of zeros, the sum is guaranteed at least this number. But we already observed that if you have at least one zero, then the left-hand side cannot be bigger than this value. And then now, easy comparison. And the left-hand side is always strictly less than right-hand side. So uh, the equality is never achieved, which means that, well, that's good because uh, we conclude that V is non-singular. So maybe I think that we have uh, 
lots of different settings of the situation, maybe different size and different number of ones and different number of zeros, something like that. But uh, maybe I think this is the uh, simplest uh, case and easy argument. But uh, uh, again, I would say there will be a variation for this problem. And I think that's the final page. And stop. Thank you. I'm wondering about the non-singular, uh, whether this matrix APM uh, is non-singular when the field is GP, I mean, the, instead of the <coughs> rational field. Right, right, so I think, I think our maybe next step is to consider this uh, finite field and some other setting of this field, but we couldn't come up with any uh, significant results yet, so maybe that's a good uh, way. Like, uh, Mandel was P? Maybe. Or some places? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> there might be a version of this uh, determ so I think you're talking about this result. So the setting is just uh, field C and infinite field, but there might be some uh, similar version in terms of this mod P situation. So if that works, then maybe you can just continue. Similar idea. And then another uh, challenge is to uh, consider such kind of the, uh, the existence of such isomorphism and so on. But I think there should be some way and some there should be some work done in this uh, direction. But I don't know that's open. Right, right. Mm. Right. Now we get the other Then we get the other one. 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 Then couldn't memorize everything, but I should say some. I just took some part from our paper saying that, well, this plays an essential role in determining a certain type of approximation power for a multiplicative wavelet. <laughs> so I can't say anything. So my co author is an expert in wavelets, and so that matrix plays some, like makes uh, the construction of some type of wavelet and so on. Yeah. Yeah. But my motivation is only yeah. on this. <laughs> right, right. So I, I, I forgot to mention this earlier. Yeah. Thanks for asking. <laughs>